we are going to take a look at a, a passage in Ephesians chapter 5 where we discover four words that will help us understand the use of our time. If you were with us last week, we're doing three weeks on time and then what the Bible says about it and how we might engage in it at the beginning of uh, this year. And then we're going to be talking about the final hours, Jesus' final life up through, final hours of his life up through Easter. So we're looking forward to doing that together in the Word. Ephesians chapter 5 is where we are. I'm going to ask you to do something with me this morning. I've included the text on the screen, but I'm going to ask you, and we're going to do this on a regular basis from here on out, uh, to stand out of respect to the Word as we read the Word together. Can you do that with me? Just stand wherever you are. <clears throat> you can still be turning there in your Bible, uh, on your translation if you wish to read it there. Um, you can, but I'm reading from the ESV up here together. So let's read this together if we could. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. May God bless his word in this reading. Go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> there are four words I want to introduce you to this morning, four words that help us understand this passage in relation to our lives, okay? And so we're just going to kind of <clears throat> unpack each one of those words in... <clears throat> And I'm going to give you an application of each of those words as well. So you'll find it in the form of a question. You might want to write those down and spend some time thinking about those words and those questions uh, later throughout the day. Here's your four words. Analyze, prioritize, surrender, and sacrifice. Okay? Analyze, prioritize, surrender, and sacrifice. Here's the first one. Analyze. Am I wasting time without realizing it? Your second word is the word prioritize. Am I giving my time to what really matters? Regarding the word surrender, here's your question. Am I investing my time in my will or God's? And in sacrifice, your question is, am I spending time on myself or others? Okay. Now, you've just read the text this morning, and we're going to find each one of these truths in there, but just kind of track with me. But before we do this, just let me pause and encourage you with something. There may be some points today, whatever age you are, where you're going to say, I don't think I'm spending my time right. That's not me telling you what to do. That's the Spirit of God through the text telling you what to do, okay? And that's really important because if you're a teenager and you say, I don't think I'm spending my time right. If you're uh, in your 60s or 70s or even in your 80s and you say, I don't think I'm spending my time right, I just want to remind you something. If I've been able to make the case from the text that that's what the verse is saying, your hang-up is not with me, okay? Your choice of how you'll spend your time differently after today is ultimately surrendering to God and not saying, I'm just going to spend the time the way I want to spend it, right? So with that in mind, let's unpack these words. Analyze, am I wasting my time without realizing? Look at verse 15. The text says in verse 15, um, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Look carefully then how you walk. The word carefully kind of gives the idea of an accountant looking at time. Now, maybe we can look, if we looked at your checkbook, we would see that you haven't balanced it, you know, since the early 1990s, okay? We would think that maybe you're not paying attention to what's going on in your bank account. I think far more people have the struggle that they don't bring that kind of auditing, accounting mindset to how they're spending their time. By the way, you and I are accountable to God for that. We're accountable to how we would spend and engage our time. And we find that because the text says, look carefully then how you walk. Now you can see in verse 16, it's going to start to talk about the best use of your time. So the context here says, listen, evaluate how and what you're doing with your time. Now when the New Testament uses the word walk, it doesn't actually communicate you're physically walking. It's a metaphorical term to communicate, listen, this is how you do life. Look carefully how you spend your time in life. In fact, let me give you three ways you're going to do that, just quick applications. Do a daily audit, forecast your findings, make incremental adjustments, okay? Do a daily audit. 
A number of years ago, um, Kim and I were at a conference, and the speaker was sharing And he'd been a pastor, and he started to talk about how as a pastor he had struggled with the use of his time. And I was responding to what he was saying, um, so like audibly, like, "Uh uh, yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. You know, I'm kind of muttering under my breath. And Kim actually kind of gives me a bit of an elbow at one point and says, listen, um, I think other people can hear you, okay? Because I was so caught up with what he was saying. And one of those occasions, he was so overwhelmed with the use of his time, he said, you know, I decided that I'd go into the office, I'd get everything set up, I'd be ready to go, and I went in there, I got early up, I got up early one morning, I walked to the door, and I saw all the work I had to do, and he said, I was just overwhelmed. And Kim says afterwards, she says, you need to talk to him, right? So I went and talked to him, and I explained, you know, that I felt some of that struggle from time to time with the use of my time. And I've never forgotten what he said. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to keep a 15-minute journal for the next two weeks. Every 15 minutes, I want you to write down what you just did. And I remember thinking, what you're thinking right now, I don't have time to get everything done. I don't have time to fill out your stupid journal. He said, I know what you're probably thinking. And then he told me what I was thinking. And then I said, okay, I'll do it. And I said, can I like do it in 30 minute increments? Because you know, that's how my, 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 my Microsoft set up. I can do my calendar in 30 minute increments. He said, you can, but I'm telling you, you'll probably get more out of it if you do 15. I remember doing this. And at the end of two weeks, I was just so taken back by how I'd spent my time. I had not really thought about or analyzed how I was spending my time. In fact, it revealed how much time I spent at work, how much time I spent watching TV, how much time I was on the phone. The journal revealed all of that. And it just struck me that I never really had given consideration, according to Ephesians chapter 5, that I looked carefully at how I was living my life and how I was spending my time. I've shared that pattern with a number of folks um, since then. They kind of look at me the same way, like, I don't have time to fill out your stupid journal. I don't have time to get everything done. I remember on one occasion, um, having shared that, that the father came to see me the next week, and he slid across the table an Excel spreadsheet. And he said, "Uh, I am so convicted. And he showed me how he tracked every 15 minutes all of his time. And he showed me how much time... he had put into work. And then at the bottom, he showed me the total time that he had spent with his children in the course of a week, and it was less than 10 minutes. Now, before you're too judgmental, you better do the journal, okay? Because it's it's liable to reveal certain things about how you're spending your time. That's why we should look carefully how we walk. That's what the text says, right? Next thing you want to do is forecast your findings. Because what you want to do is multiply your discovery by the rest of your life. I'm going to do that this morning, um, just briefly with you. <clears throat> this morning I uh, picked up on my phone, the Wall Street Journal sent an article about giving smartphones to children and what age is age appropriate. Right? And the father in the article articulated how he'd really wrestled with it. It was a really stupid idea to give a smartphone to his son, but guess what? All the other sons who were his son's age, and it was a pretty young age, um, had them, and so eventually he buckled and gave in to his son. So just let me give you a few statistics, and this is how you would take your journal and forecast it forward. Um, Studies show that the average young person spends 10 hours a day in screen time. So that means they got their phone out, they're on their phone, they're on the computer, they're spending 10 hours a day in screen time. So I'm going to forecast that number. Let's say that was discovered in a journal, in a 15-minute journal. We're going to forecast that number forward. That's 3,650 hours a year. Okay? Let me forecast that a little bit further forward. Between the ages of 10 and 20, that's when we do a bulk of our learning and growing. Um, that's going to work out to 36,500 hours. Okay? Now, let me take that backwards and divide it by 24. That's going to be 1,520 days between the ages of 10 and 20 that an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, 13-year-old is going to spend on their phone. Divided by 365, you ready for that? That's four years of their life between the ages of 10 and 20 that they're going to spend on their phone. 
Now, moms and dads are saying, that's why I don't want them to have a phone. Hold on. If you're saying that with your phone in your hand, that's not going to be very convincing. Okay? Here's the thing. If I just take that and forecast that number forward, that means by the time a young person turns 70, they will have spent two decades with me. 20 years, 24-hour days, no opportunity to eat, drink, or sleep, 24-hour window days, they will have spent 20 years in front of the screen. That's what happens when you look carefully how you walk, and then you just forecast it forward. It causes you to look differently at how you're spending your time. You say, but Phil, if I tell my 11-year-old or 12-year-old to give that up, okay, that's going to create a serious meltdown, and we're going to be in here for counseling before the week's out. Okay? And if I have to do it, I'm probably going to have to go into some kind of culture shock because my thumbs are going to like, they're going to start punching things like they're texting, even though I don't have a phone in them. Okay? Here's what I want to tell you. Make incremental adjustments. Commit to discipline changes with the use of your time. Okay? Say, okay, I've got to engage in some kind of uh, electronic fast or something to give up the time because now that I look carefully at it, I have to acknowledge I'm not really spending it well. I'm spending it poorly. And by the way, some of this has to do with, we sung this morning from the inside out, some of it has to do with some inside desires. So let me just kind of unpack those for you a second. We live in an entitlement society. We kind of pick some of that up. We think I worked all day. I deserve to just kind of hang out and chill out tonight. I just want to remind you, you just didn't work for the Lord, but in all that you did, you're doing it for the Lord, which means even how you spend the rest of your time, it's not just yours to chill out. Okay? It's yours to say, how would I spend this time to be effective for the Lord? Analyze. Am I wasting time without realizing it? Here's your second word. Making the best use of your time because the days are evil. We talk about the word prioritize because we are saying make the best use of your time. Which answers this question. <clears throat> Am I giving my time to what really matters? Okay. In fact, we see it there. The best use of your time. Let me just unpack a couple of those words for you. Where you see the word best use, some of your translations might read the word redeeming the time. That's actually the Greek language. It actually means that we're going to buy back the time. The other word I want you to see is the word time there in the text, because there's two different Greek words that communicate time. One is the Greek word chronos, you hear chronology in it, and the other word is the Greek word kairos, and I'm going to explain those in just a second. So before we go very far, just note those two words, best use of your time, and note also that last part of the phrase, the days are evil. So let me give you some questions, some ideas rather, that go with prioritize. Am I giving my time to what really matters? The first thing you want to do is see your time as valuable, that is, redeem it. Okay? See your time as valuable. I mean by that, redeem it. The Greek word that is translated here in the English Standard Version renders it best time. <coughs> Make um, make, uh, <clears throat> making the best use of your time, rather, is the word exagorazo. Now, that's a word that is actually translated in our English Bibles as the word redeem. Um, it's the word that communicates um, that we were, it's actually used spiritually as well, to communicate we were redeemed out of our old way of life. In fact, agorazo means to purchase Ex agorazo means to purchase ex and take out. And the picture in the Bible was this, that a slave was on the slave block being sold, and an owner came in and bought him and took him out. The biblical picture is this, that Christ bought us with his blood, took us out, and set us free. Now, this is really important, because the same word is used here regarding the best use of your time. Think about this. You and I were, have value because Jesus came. Here's the word again. You were redeemed, not with silver and gold, the text says, but by the precious blood of Christ that God redeemed us. God esteemed on us value because we were bought with a price. I just don't think we think about our time that way, that our time, our minutes have value. Our moments have value. Making the best use of that time. Imagine momentarily, you go in to the shopping 
to the shopping mall or to the grocery store. You look at items, you purchase items. We live in a world where you got multiple choices, right? But you deem one item is more valuable than the other. You buy it and take it out. We just need to bring that same kind of understanding of value to our time. See time is valuable. Here's the second idea. See time as an opportunity. Don't assume you'll have another window just like it. Right? Now, one of the things that makes time valuable, and the scripture communicates this in Ephesians 5, is that we should make the best use of our time. Now, I mentioned to you that there's two Greek words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos means chronology. It describes a time that is a space of time. Like, um, like if you go to the cemetery and you see the dash between a person's life. It says 1901 and 1989 or something like that, and you see the dash. That describes their whole life. That's chronology. That's chronos time. Okay? That's that kind of time. Kairos is completely different. Kairos is a kind of time that speaks of a specific window or a select amount. It's a fixed, definite period. And nowhere is that perceived, I think, or applied more clearly than in relationships. So let's just talk about that for a second. You need to see your relationships as windows of opportunity. Um, I remember when Kim and I were first married a long time ago in a galaxy far, far, far away. Uh, when we were first married, we didn't have the challenges with time that we have now. There were no children. There was no... Uh, there was no 24-hour-a-day kind of ongoing ministry. There was not the work. There was not the schedules. There were not the conflicts. Um, and we look back at those four years when I was in seminary back in California as just a really unique time for our marriage. Okay. Now, I've loved being married to her the rest of those years, but I will tell you that that was a unique time. If I had thought in that window... Um, I'm in seminary now, so I'm going to put off this kind of relationship with Kim. We won't go for walks down Montrose Boulevard in the middle of the evening. We, we won't do this because I've got to study. In fact, Kim will tell you, she was usually the one who said, you know, we came out here, so you should go to seminary. You better get back in there and study again, all right? So, um, but if I had not done that, I would have lost the window for that. You with me? Some of your lives have unique windows of relationship. And what I want to remind you of is making the best use of your time, replace the word time with opportunity, and know that that opportunity is not going to be there forever. In fact, that same expression is used over in Galatians 6.10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are the household of faith. That's the same word that's used for time over in Ephesians 5. You and I need to look at life as those opportunities. So I was thinking of some of those for me this morning. Um, I remember some of the Kairos moments in my life in regards to my relationships. We're, we're, we're taking um, my daughters to a father-daughter dance. Right? And I remember that on one of those occasions, the oldest daughter was off to college. <clears throat> I was taking my younger daughter, and I hit a curb, blew two tires out of my car, and I didn't know what I'd done to the bottom of it, drove it up to the restaurant on flat tires. And I remember thinking, this is a, like a Kairos moment. It's not her fault that I hit the curb. But I could have a tendency to kind of hunker down in self-pity and say, now what am I going to do, right? Or I can just forget about the car. It's in the parking lot. It's safe. And spend time focusing on Anna. And I remember being grateful afterwards that God enabled me to do that. We had to hitchhike home. But no, no, I'm just kidding. We... we we got a ride home at the end of the night. It was just like, it worked out. And I remember thinking, this is the kind of night where typically I would have been so consumed with chronology. Like, how am I going to get this fixed next week? And what's coming after that? And where am I going to get the money for this? And, and I would have thought chronology-wise as opposed to a Kairos moment-wise. Now, you say, well, okay, I, I like some of those Kairos moments. I just don't see them. They're there. Okay? But sometimes you and I have to insert them. Like, um... A, number, a couple of weeks ago, I talked Asa into going fishing with me at a local pond, and he ended up catching the biggest bass I'd ever seen in my life. And it was like, hey, Dad, I caught a pretty big fish. And I'm saying, that's not a big fish. That's a bigger fish than I've ever caught. Like, how do you do that? Like, you know, like, and it was like this incredible Kairos moment that years from now we'll look back and say, that was a Kairos moment. 
But it was only a Kairos moment because I interrupted my chronology moment long enough to say, this is what I'm going to do. Sometimes those Kairos moments and Kronos moments collide. My favorite story of that is when my father was uh, pushing 80, Kim said to me, and I wisely took my wife's advice, she said, you know, you ought to take your dad on a fishing trip. He took you on fishing trips when you were young. Why don't you take him on a fishing trip? And so we made this arrangement to go uh, to the Madison River um, out in Montana, and we flew into Salt Lake City. We drove up there, and there was a point on the first evening where my dad had gone down a bank, and he was fishing, and he says to me, hey, hey, can you help me up? And I went over. This is a Kairos moment, right, where you're fishing with your dad, and he's nearly 80. And I went down, and I took his hand, and it was like, it was like a time warp happened. And I remembered that I used to be down at the bottom of the bank, and I could feel how strong his hand was. And that it didn't matter how weak mine was, he was just lifting me right up out of there. Okay? But I realized that now m the strength was in my hand and it wasn't in my dad's hand. Like it was almost a surprise. Like if I let go of him, he's going to slide right back down the bank. And I remember thinking as he's coming up, that's really odd. I don't remember it ever being like this. That is where a Kairos moment and a Kronos moment collide where all of a sudden I realize, wow, how did 25 years pass? Just like that. But if I had not engaged by my wife's counsel in a Kairos moment with him, I would have never had the moment. And I remember something happened to me right at that moment. As he was coming up, I was thinking, I don't know how much longer I have with my dad. And when we drove back, um, we could have gone fishing another day, and I said to my dad, hey, listen, why don't we get up at 4 o'clock in the morning tomorrow morning, and if we drive down the other side of the mountains, we'll go through Yellowstone Park. And my dad said, that sounds like a great idea. I haven't been through Yellowstone in like 50 years. Or so I said, okay, so let, let's do that. And so together we drove, got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, drove down the other side, and when we parked that car at Salt Lake City, my dad said to me, there are things I've learned about you that I never knew. And I bet there's some things you learned about me that you never knew. These moments do not happen unless you and I see them as select windows of opportunity. And I speak to you dads for a second. Maybe you only got 10 minutes with your kids. You're losing the window of opportunity. And I speak to you as parents for a moment. Maybe you're so busy and you're making meals and you're doing everything you want to do and you're forgetting that there is a Kairos moment right there. And I speak to you as sons and daughters for a moment. Even if your parents are older, you can still have those moments. But you and I need to see those moments as given as unique windows from God. They are Kairos moments. Here's your final one. See, time is a challenge. I just don't think we realize that the text says the days are evil. They're not neutral, right? They're evil. They're not neutral. That's a fascinating word chosen for evil. It doesn't speak of the word like intrinsically evil. It speaks of the word as an effect or influence of evil. Another word is it's not, another word will describe evil as the essential character, intrinsic evil. That's not this word. This word means that here is evil and it influences you. That if you're not careful, the evil influences of our world will influence how you're thinking about time. This is so important. It's not just going to happen naturally. You and I are going to have to make a commitment in our time to spend it that way. Wow. What a great reminder. Don't think that it'll just happen because the days are evil, so face it like a challenge. How do you prioritize? Am I giving my time to what really matters? See time as valuable. See time as an opportunity. See time as a challenge. Let's talk about this other phrase. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is great, because now for the first time, we're being introduced to how we ought to spend our time. We ought to spend our time thinking in terms of the will of the Lord, not the will of you and me. Now, just for a moment, remember that this idea of surrender is something that's captured like throughout the Bible. You go back to Genesis chapter 12, you see that Abraham surrenders and says, okay, <clears throat> God told me to go to a land he's going to show me and I'm going to start walking tomorrow morning. And uh, I've always just kind of smiled at that conversation that probably happened between Abraham and Sarah. Sarah wakes up and she says to Abraham, what are you doing this morning? He said, we're moving. Where are we moving to? I don't know. And I can almost picture Sarah saying, 
Guys already try to get somewhere without directions. You're trying to get somewhere without a location. Okay. But Sarah followed, and God moved them, and God gave them the land of Israel. It's just a remarkable thing how the Bible is full of people who surrendered. Fast forward to Exodus chapter 3. There is Moses. He sees a burning bush. He walks up to the burning bush. He starts to talk to the burning bush. That's a little odd, right? But that's because the burning bush is talking to him. He starts to argue with the burning bush. That's not a good thing to do. Right? God, I can't go. I can't speak very well. I have a stuttering problem. I, what am I going to say when I get there? See, he is not surrendering there, but God will bring him to a point of surrender. It's always about God's will or what God wants, not about what we want or what our will is. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I thought about Noah. Man, talk about a commitment to do the will of God for a very long time. He builds a boat for 100 years on dry land. Probably the whole world laughs at him. He's busy doing the will of God. And ultimately, could we not fully grasp <clears throat> that even in the Apostle Paul, if you fast forward to the New Testament, you find Paul saying something like, um, by the way, Jesus, God sends uh, a messenger to Paul to say, listen, go talk to Paul and show him what he must suffer for my sake. There it is. The will of God sometimes includes suffering. And no one communicates this more clearly to us in the New Testament than, say it with me, Jesus, right? who says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done prior to the cross. Here's a couple of thoughts from you from Christian ministers of old. D Dwight L. Moody captured it this way. No one can sum up all God is able to accomplish through one solitary life, wholly yielded, there's your surrender idea, adjusted and obedient to him. No one can say what you could do. No one knows what would happen if you and I said, it's only about the will of God, how I spend my time. It's not about my will. A.W. Tozier, <clears throat> also a Chicago minister up there for years, said, the man or woman who is holy or joyously surrendered to Christ can't make a wrong choice. Any choice will be the right one. So if you say, I don't know what I'm going to do, work on the surrender side first. Say, listen, <clears throat> um, I want to be drawn, as the text says, to the will of God. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And Tozier said, listen, when that is your focus, there aren't bad decisions. Okay. They're good decisions. I'll give you uh, this other phrase and capture our last word. So we've talked about analyze, prioritize, surrender, one more word, sacrifice. And I love this because the text here begins to articulate how it is that we should be engaged in others' relationships. You see, drunkenness is not the only debauchery. There's all kinds of other ways that we surround ourselves by our temptations so that we can spend our time on them. But I note this. The text says, listen, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit regarding your time. Wow. That's such a great thought because that tells you that not only should you be careful about how you spend it, but you need to know that the Holy Spirit has empowered you to spend it right. If you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, He will help you spend your time properly. And finally, am I characterized as serving others with joy or out of obligation? Think about it. And I've done both, so I can tell a difference even in my own life. I know what it's like to go and do a task and say, I really don't want to do this, but I have to do it because it's, I'm obligated. I also know what it's like to go and say, Wow, I really am excited about this. I can't wait to do this. The text says that you and I are to address one another. And then it gives singing words like psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart with the Lord. In other words, internally, I am joyful when I talk to someone or engage with someone else. They are not a burden. They are a joy. They are not a burden. They are a privilege. That's how you and I should begin to look at our time spent with others. Wow. And I love this because verse 21 reminds us, verse 20, that while we're thankful in that, verse 21, we're submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Am hmm. I characterized as serving others with joy or out of obligation? Because it's a heartfelt matter, not just a time matter. 
Well, those are the questions we ought to ask ourselves regarding time this week. So do this for me, okay? Do this for the fact that the Lord's convicting you, not because I'm saying it. Analyze your life. Am I wasting time without realizing it? Prioritize your life. Am I giving my time to what really matters? Surrender. Am I investing time in my will or God's? And finally, sacrifice. Am I spending my time, my time on myself or others? Four words that shape our time.